I think we'll start the session now. A warm welcome and good evening to all. First of all, happy Diwali. Rural Service Bootcamp is back with another edition this Sunday. We'll be having a session on basics in wound management. This is something we come across on a daily basis, and at any level, we should be good at managing it with our limited resources we have in our bond centers. To guide us through, we have excellent speakers lined up for the session. The session will be led by Dr. Angelin Mascaranis, junior clinic, working as a junior clinical fellow in the AMD Luton and Dunstable University Hospital, UK. She was she was a JR in the Department of Emergency Medicine and must be a familiar face to many. Uh, we have Dr. Vijay Montero, who will be moderating the session and might be, will be taking up the questions. Uh, he is a very familiar face to us. He is uh, commonly known as Grand C. He is a consultant surgeon in St. Joseph's Mission Hospital, Manandawadi, Kerala currently. He is from the batch of 2009 and known to many as a super efficient and vibrant surgery PD from Unit 1. A few reminders, please keep yourself muted throughout the meeting. If you have a query, please type into the chat box or the Join at Academics WhatsApp group. A feedback form will be shared on both the above mentioned platforms. Please fill it before you leave the meeting. Welcome to Dr. Angelin and Dr. Granci. Uh, over to you now, Angelin. Thank you, Dijo. Um, I just want to know, can I be heard properly? Yes, you are audible. Lovely. Um, so good evening and welcome to everybody. Uh, as um, you know, I'm Angelina Nevet Mascarinas. Just to add to Dijo's uh, introduction, I've also done my internship there, so you would have seen my face. Um, for this session that we're going to do basics for wound management, I have Dr. Grancy, who we all very well know as Grancy, uh, fondly know him as. Uh, he's been my mentor and he's going to be our guide for the discussion that we're going to have in the evening. Uh, before we proceed, I just want to let you know that the session, I want the session to be a little more interactive. Uh, towards the end, we have cases. So it's going to be a discussion where I want one of you all to uh, volunteer. And so we can have a good discussion based on how to manage different types of wounds and the complication. Okay. Um, so moving ahead, um, just uh, sorry to interrupt. And sorry yeah. to interrupt, Angelin. Uh, can you uh, dismiss the uh, Teams yeah. uh, pop up? Yeah. Is that okay now? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay. So today we'll be dealing with bases of wound management. I think this is such an important topic to every medical professional. Uh, we come across wounds on a daily basis, different kinds of wounds, and managing it on uh, managing it in a very uh, in a well um, managing it well could be very beneficial to the patient in terms of improving the quality of life and also promote healing. Uh, so. The topics that we're going to be touching on today, I'm quickly going to go through definition of wounds, types of wounds, stages of wound healing, uh, the factors that affect wound healing, which are important, and mainly deal with management of wounds and the types of dressing. So um, as we all know, a wound is defined as a break in the continuity of the skin or mucous membrane associated with disruption of structure and function. So now when we see a wound, we need to classify the wound as to what kind of wound is it. So um, we classify it based, first when we initially see the wound is what was the mechanism that caused the injury? And two is whether the wound is tidy or untidy. So I'm first going to be dealing with when you see a wound, what kind of wound it is based on mechanism. Um, so based on whether the skin is involved and the internal tissues are exposed or not, we have open wounds and we have closed wounds. So open wounds involves incisions, lacerations, abrasions, puncture wounds, and closed wounds are contusions and hematomas. Pressure wounds are a little of both, mainly involving ulcers, which calls for another day on the entire topic of how to deal with it and how to go about it. Um, uh, with open wounds, coming to open wounds, um, in, coming to incisions. Incisions are like clean wounds that are usually caused by sharp objects, where you have the edges of the wound are quite regular and can be approximated easily. Um, 
Coming to lacerations, lacerations are usually caused by shearing forces, causing irregular edges. And dealing with this could be a little tricky when it comes to approximation of such wounds. Abrasions, as all we know, as all of us know, it's known as typically known as road rash. These are very superficial um, uh, uh, skin uh, skin lesions that that can be managed very easily and do not have, need extensive treatment. Just antiseptic precautions would help in healing of such wounds. And then we come to an important wound that all of us come across: our puncture wounds. Though they might look really small to us, um, knowing actually knowing the depth of the wound, involvement of tissue, um, is is a little is a little tricky in dealing with these wounds. Uh, we will come to it uh, when we when we discuss the cases uh, how to deal with such puncture wounds. Um, coming to closed wounds, we have contusions and hematoma. These are usually caused. These are caused by blunt force um, blunt forces. So contusions are just breaks in break in small capillaries and hematomas. You have large vessels involved, which causes accumulation of blood. Now it's not enough to just classify the wound on just what kind of wound it is, whether it's an open wound or a closed wound. The next thing when we see the wound is, we should ask the question is, is this wound tidy or untidy? The first thing is whether whether it's clean or contaminated, whether there's a foreign body, we should, all these questions should be running around in our, at the back of our minds when we are, when we are dealing with wounds. So the first thing is tidy wounds. These are incised wounds, they're clean wounds. Uh, the tissue of the wounds look healthy and there's seldom loss of tissue. There's not much loss of tissue. Uh, the second wound would be untidy wounds where these involve crush injury, or whilst injuries. Wounds are contaminated with soil, foreign bodies. You've got demetalized tissue and also a loss of tissue. So these are two questions that you've got to keep in mind when you're dealing with wounds. Quickly moving through the stages of wound healing because when we manage wounds, we are also uh, uh, aiding in wound healing. So, um, and we are we we try to aid in the different stages of wound healing. Uh, our role comes in mainly in the first three stages, that is hemostasis, inflammation, and the proliferative phase. And remodeling is not much under our control, but um, yeah, we will see how it is. So the first thing is the hemostasis phase, where you have. Uh, accumulation of blood post the injury, where there's a formation of a thrombus. The inflammatory phase is post hemostasis, you've got activation of cytokines, there's a release of large amount of vasoactive substances, um, there's migration of neutrophils and macrophages. So this is an important stage where it helps to fight infections and also removes devitalized tissues. So usually during this phase, it's going to be char characterized by um, four features that we're going to see is ruber, color, dollar, and tumor, um, which is redness that you will initially see, uh, increased temperature, uh, swelling of the area, and pain. So these are the four things that you will come across during the stages of this stage of healing. And this usually inflammatory stage occurs from the third, uh, second to the third day. Then you have the proliferative phase which and the remodeling phase, which takes us into weeks. Um, proliferative phase is just angiogenesis happening, re epithelization, there's collagen being deposited, and um, a remodeling phase is, um, is just a collagen, just the maturation of collagen and realignment of collagen. So, the, in these two phases, especially the proliferative and the remodeling phase, the thing that we need to keep in mind is vitamin C plays a very important role. Uh, which is required in collagen formation. So just at the back of the mind in to promote wound healing, just remember vitamin C over there. Um, so when we are dealing with wounds um, uh, and, and we see a wound, we uh, um, assess the wound, we need to now see whether, how could this heal in the best way? Uh, so when we're dealing with closure and healing of wounds, there are different, uh, there are different types of in, um, healing of wounds. You have primary intention, secondary intention, and the tertiary intention. So primary intention wounds are usually wounds such as like an incised wound. You have edges which are linear, they can be easily approximated. So you quickly take in sutures or you put steady strips or different ways of managing it and 
uh, these wounds can usually heal faster. There's a low risk of infection and scarring is on, also uh, on, uh, on scarring too is lesser in such kind of wounds. So you have incised wounds, you have surgical wounds as examples, paper cut wounds. Uh, those are examples of healing by primary intention. The second uh, form of uh, healing is by secondary intention. Uh, there are wounds such as large wounds, extensive tissue loss, uh, ulcers, burns, where um, the wounds cannot be, uh, the skin cannot be approximated. There's a loss of tissue, um, there's, or any, there's signs of infection. So what you do is you just leave these wounds to be as it is and allow the, wound, allow the body to heal by itself by granulation. So, how, um, so this is secondary intention. But the only thing to keep in mind is during this kind of intention, um, uh, healing, there's, there's a high risk of infection and scarring because the, skin, the underlying tissues are exposed. Skin acts as a barrier for infections and more tissue damage. So uh, healing by secondary intention always increases the risk of um, infection and scarring. The third kind of intention is uh, healing is tertiary intention where these, these wounds are usually left open, um, just left open for a certain amount of time. And when you have proper healing, when the skin is easily approximated, you then take in sutures or then uh, do whatever is required surgically uh, to promote healing. So these are usually um, in animal bites, avulsions, and we will be dealing how uh, we will be, we will go into detail how to deal with such kind of wounds, especially animal bites, when we do the case discussion. Um, important thing to keep in mind are the factors that affect wound healing. You have local factors and systemic factors. Local factors could be vascular insufficiency, very important, that's both arterial and venous. Arterial is like, for example, if the patient has peripheral vascular disease, um, you have less amount of blood flow to the area and blood plays a very important role in promoting healing. So you're going to have, so this is one factor that could uh, hamper healing. Again, venous insufficiencies where you have varicose veins, um, uh, deep vein thrombosis, these two can affect uh, healing because there's a constant pooling of blood, constant edema that's ha uh, uh, fluid accumulating over there, which could hamper healing. Uh, other factors are previous radiation, uh, exposure to radiation, constant pressure. Uh, for example, if, if the wound is at the back or where there's constant pressure or wounds over joint joints where there's constant movement, that too can affect uh, how fast wound healing can happen. Uh, our body is a natural, um, uh, our body has a natural way of dealing with anything that comes across that's unusual to us. So there are a lot of systemic factors too that play a very important role in um, in wound healing. And uh, these factors need to be kept in mind, especially uh, when you're taking a history, take a detailed history to see what could be the possible factors that could hamper wound healing. You want healing to happen fast and more effectively. Some of the things are malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, especially vitamin C deficiency, as we dealt in um, um, in the stages of healing, uh, mineral deficiency. We have systemic illnesses like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, anemia that could uh, affect healing. Medications would include if the patient's on steroids, um, chemotherapy, immunotherapy. Again, all of this is going to affect wound healing as a whole. Uh, other factors, all personal factors would be history of smoking, uh, alcohol consumption, obesity, and also old age. So coming to the mainstay of this discussion is uh, wound healing. Um, how to manage wounds. Um, so we're going to be a little more detailed in this. Uh, the principle, the main goal of wound management is to aid in the natural process of healing of the body. The body has a lovely uh, mechanism of healing anything in the body. So we're just going to provide the optimal environment uh, for wound healing to happen. 
Uh, now, wound healing just uh, like wound management just does not involve you've got a wound over there and you're just going to manage it. It involves you taking extensive detailed history first and then assessing the wound before you can come to a decision as to what I need to do for the patient, how can I manage this wound and how can the patient benefit from this. Um, so history taking and all of us need to take a detail, detailed history with any type of wound. Um, it gives us a good idea of what the mechanism of injury is. How did the injury happen? What kind of instrument was involved? Whether uh, it gives us an idea whether the wound could be contaminated or not, whether there could be a foreign possibility of a foreign body in. So getting a good history would be very important and also what time the injury happened, especially if you're dealing with crushed injuries, or deep loving injuries, um, which require extensive management, not only in terms of just wound management, but also uh, medically managing the patient. All of this is very important to get the time of the injury. Next thing is we just don't deal with the, just the wound that has happened. Take a detailed history of personal history, medical history, surgical history, just to get a good, um, to identify factors that could possibly delay wound healing and to try and manage those so that we can promote wound healing. The next thing that we need to keep in mind as we're taking history is tetani uh, tetanus immunization. Um, if you're dealing with kids, it's, it's much more easy because most kids now in India are, are immunized by the national um, immunization protocol. But uh, if you're dealing with elderly, uh, elderly individuals, please, please make sure that you take an immun uh, tetanus immunization history so that you know whether it needs to be given or not. Um, after taking history, the next thing we need to do is assess the wound. So I have a small mnemonic over here by, by, uh, by the form of times. Um, T stands for look at the wound when you're assessing the wound. See what is involved, what tissue involvement, whether it's just skin, whether it's dermis, is it deeper involving the muscle, bone, Look at it, have a good visualization while you're, while you're assessing the wound to see what kind of tissue involvement is, uh, is involved in the injury. Uh, it's just not, in, just not um, enough to just see what it is, just see if the tissue is viable or not, um, contaminated or not, whether it is soil, whether you have any foreign body. So these are things of the tissue involvement. Coming to eye, you have infections and inflammation. Look for signs of infection. You might have a chronic um, um, wound that's been there for a long time, not healing. Um, look for signs of infection and inflammation, like redness. Is there a local rise of temperature? Um, if, if there are signs of pus oozing out from it, uh, how does the wound generally look, whether there's granulation or not? So look for that stands for eye that inflammation and infection now um coming to m is moisture level this mainly involves whether the wound is actively bleeding or not whether you need to intervene whether you need to stop bleeding stop the bleeding so that would be moisture as well as whether in if, if you're dealing with chronic wounds whether there's chronic edema constant oozing of fluid how could you manage it so look for moisture levels the next thing you would want to see is the edge of the wounds. Um, as I told you, when we were dealing with healing of the wounds, we have primary intention, secondary intention, tertiary intention. To see if the edges of the wound are clean, whether they're regular, whether they can be approximated to promote faster healing. So look for the edges of the wound and then the surrounding tissue, whether it is viable, healthy, um, whether the tissue is frail, so look for the surrounding tissue, uh, surrounding skin too. Uh, whether there's another wound, please make sure that there's a, you're not missing out on another, uh, another wound that could be possibly there. Um, so coming to wound management, we have different um, stages of wound management. First, we would be dealing with hemostasis, then cleaning the wound, um, and that during the entire thing is how to manage the wound, uh, how to manage pain. So analysis is what to use and how to use them. And um, then coming is to how how would I how would we close the skin? How would we promote healing? So skin closure. Finally, we'll be dealing with dressing of the wounds and how to follow up such patients 
And more importantly, before we discharge patients or before we could send patients off is covering them with antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis. So the first thing would be hemostasis. Uh, hemostasis, so you have a wound that's, uh, you've got a patient who's been actively bleeding, you need to control the blood, but there are different methods of um, controlling, uh, achieving hemostasis. First thing would be apply pressure. All of us put in a pair of gloves, apply pressure with, with the help of gauze as much as possible. Try and see if the bleeding is has stopped. If the injury is involved limbs, especially the upper limbs, lower limbs, just elevating the limbs and reducing the amount of blood flow to the limbs would aid in achieving hemostasis. Sometimes it could be really difficult in managing, um, in controlling blood, uh, uh, um, uh, like bleeding. So there are a few things that could be done is you're applying pressure, but it's not stopped. So what you can do is just take Tranexa soaked gauze, uh, tranexamic acid soaked gauze that can also achieve hemostasis or adrenaline soaked gauze. But be careful when you're uh, using adrenaline. I will be, be dealing with that a little more uh, later. The next thing is you apply pressure. Uh, bleeding hasn't stopped yet. You've done all possible things. Uh, you, uh, when you see the wound, you think, okay, it could be possible or possibly an arterial involvement or there's massive blood. You want to control hemostasis. You do not want more bleeding to happen. So you have another method of tonic application. This could be a little tricky uh, in uh, applications of uh, tonic, but could be life-saving life -saving in many injuries, especially when you're at a primary center. You, have, you do not have much resources patient is extensively bleeding, you need to refer the patient. So this, uh, this is another method that could help you in controlling um, uh, bleeding from the side. So uh, a little things about um, application of a tonic aid. Please remember there are three things to be kept in mind. When you apply a tonic aid, apply it at least two to three inches above um, the wound that is, um, that is there. Uh, do not apply these tonic aids around uh, joints, joints, they're not going to be very helpful. And two is when you apply um, uh, the, the, uh, the application, when you apply the tonic aid, please don't make it too tight that's, that you cause the limb to go into acute limb ischemia. Uh, it should be sufficiently tight to stop venous blood flow, but not absolutely the arterial blood flow. So make sure that the tonic aid is not very tight. And the third thing to keep in mind is when you apply the tonic aid, please, please note the time of you uh, putting the tonic aid in because this would give, um, you cannot just keep a tonic aid in forever, like uh, keep dry tonic aid and let it be there forever. Then it will go into a cubital machine. So uh, note, the, note the time and relieve the, um, the tonic aid every 20 to 30 minutes. So that's how to go about with tonic aid application. The next thing would be suturing. Um, if, if you're not able to achieve hemostasis, the next, the last option would you would be is to for you to immediately go in and take intact sutures so to stop the bleeding. So we will be dealing with that also in, in closure. Now, analgesics. Now, dealing with the wound could be very painful, especially depending on the involvement of the tissue. So you have Analgesics, please give, an, uh, uh, please give the patient analgesics when you're either cleaning the wound. You might even have to give it earlier before assessing the wound. Um, uh, so it involves both systemic analgesics and local analgesics. Um, I'm quickly going to go through the systemic analgesics. You can either give the patient paracetamol if it's extensive involvement involving bones, tissue, crushed injury, severe injury. You might want to go ahead in uh, escalating the amount of um, the, the analgesic that you give. So go up the ladder. You might have to give uh, morphine, fentanyl, opioids, that is. So try and go up the ladder. Try and avoid any sense in, in patients with, um, with uh, active bleed because that could cause an extensive bleed because of the antiplatelet activity over there. Uh, going to be mainly dealing with local anesthesia, how you go about it. So the first thing that you use is lidocaine or lignocaine. Could be used with or without adrenaline. Now the dose to use in lidocaine is 3, uh, 3 mg per kg, which you infiltrate around the wound. 
Uh, it could be used with adrenaline too, which helps in aiding hemostasis. But one thing that should be kept in mind during the entire, um, uh, uh, if you're using adrenaline is avoid it in, in areas where there are end arteries where, it, for example, your fingers, your toes, your nose, your um, your ear lobes. These are end artery areas where if you're going to inject it, uh, adrenaline because it's a vasoconstrictor, you're going to have uh, ischemia happening over there, which you don't want. So when you're using adrenaline, please be careful of where you're using adrenaline. Next thing would be cleaning the wound. So it's very important to clean the wound. Um, the first thing would be, uh, so while you're cleaning the wound is to irrigate the wound either with normal saline, either under low pressure or high pressure. Um, so irrigate the wound, wash the wound nicely, try and remove as much as you can. Uh, you can also use disinfectants like, uh, that's betadine or covidine, iodine. You can use hydrogen peroxide. Uh, just don't uh, disinfect the wound with alcohol and detergents because they're going to be causing more scarring, more tissue injury. So avoid alcohol and detergent. The next thing is to decontaminate the wound. Have a good look at the wound. See if you can see any foreign bodies and remove them because foreign bodies are going to hamper wound healing and cause uh, and could be a source of infection. So try and remove so that to decontaminate the wound and the. The, the third thing would be debride the wound. If you're going to see a lot of devitalized tissue, try and remove with the help of a blade, try and remove the devitalized tissue um, um, so that the wound is healthy. Um, the next thing was cleaning the wound also includes antibiotics, which I will be dealing in the next few slides. Coming to skin closure, um, so you have um different forms of skin closure especially if you're dealing with <coughs> i'm sorry uh dealing with um a wound that can be easily approximated and sutured so you have suturing you have uh, staples in children especially in children where dealing with cut wounds would, would be tedious and uh, uh would be a task in itself so tissue ad 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 adhesive glue and steady strips are very important if available at your um at your primary healthcare center. Uh, coming to suturing, just I'm just going to quickly go through what kind of suture material is used. Um, if the wound is quite superficial, uh, you you don't have to suture it in layers. We use non-absorbable sutures, ethylene or proline, and then if you need to suture the wounds in um, uh, in layers, you might have to first suture the inner layer with bicryl. And then go up to the go up to the surface with a non-absorbable suture such as ethylon. Size of suturing again depends on which area where you're where you're using. If, uh, like the size, as you go with the size going higher, the the um the suture material gets thinner. So depending on where you're suturing, the size matters. So as I covered, tissue adhesive glue, very, very, very useful in children um, and also steri strips. Uh, and also staples can be used in skin closure. Coming to the main um, topic of dressing, I think this is one thing as one thing that comes to mind is what do I do for the patient? How do I dress the patient and how do I promote healing? So the main purpose of wound healing is to provide an ideal environment for wound healing. We've got to mimic the skin, which is a barrier in itself to prevent contamination, infection, and further damages. Um, so the different types of wound healing, you have um, uh, absorbent uh, healing, you have non-adherent healing, you have occlusive, semi-occlusive. I'm just going to be just touching on them. And then you have medicated dressings. So you... The main thing that I'm going to be dealing with is absorb absorbent dressing, non adherent dressing, and medicated dressing. Because in a primary healthcare setup where you have limited resources, these are the three things that you could help, could use in dressing. So um, the first thing that I'm going to be doing is absorbent dressing. This um, mainly includes gauze, which we all know, which we're all very familiar with gauze and foams. This is basically 
used for wounds that are constantly oozing. Um, there's leakage of fluids, there's blood. Um, so you can use absorbent fluids in order to keep the area dry. So these help in absorbing, uh, absorbing the fluids and also makes the patient quite comfortable. However, the only disadvantage in this is it might require regular dressing, especially if the wound is continuously oozing. You might have to change the dressing at a regular interval. And because of this constant moisture that is there, it could, it could attract infection and there's a higher risk of infection over here in, in, in such kind of dressing. But really helpful, especially in, when, when you are at, um, at a place where there are limited resources. The next thing is non-adherent dressings. Uh, these are usually bone, uh, used in bones where you do not want to cause more injury. For example, burns, um, a burns injury, where if you're going to place gauze directly on a burns wound or um, place cotton over it, it's going to it's going to be adherent to the tissue. And uh, when you're trying to dress and pull off, you're, you're going to cause even more injury and it's never going to be aiding and healing. So you have absorbent dressings like you have Vaseline gauze, you have paraffin, um, paraffin gauze. Uh, so these are dressings that can be used over wounds, especially over um, wounds like burns. They, have, they are less occlusive, they can be easily changed and um, yeah, they also help in draining fluid. So these are non-adherent dressings. Um, when I come to occlusive dressings, um, these are usually like, uh, there are different forms in this. You have biological, non-biological. Just a quick thing on non-biological would be, as all of us are very familiar with the word tegadam, we all know what tegadam is. So these are occlusive dressings. Um, uh, they have, to, uh, they are waterproof dressings and you, these are see-through dressings where you're gonna be able to assess the wounds without opening the wound again and reassessing the wound. So you, these are usually permeable to oxygen and carbon dioxide and are usually waterproof and do not need to be, they do not need to be changed in a regular interval. So they're very, very useful, especially in a post-surgical where you've sutured a wound, um, uh, post-surgical, post they're usually used post-surgical, um, uh, post-surgery to dress wounds. Uh, the other one is, uh, the last thing would be medicated wounds, uh, medicated dressings. So medicated dressings would be either use of antiseptics or uh, antibiotics. <laughs> so antibiotics would be either, before, before you could dress, application of neosporin or uh, mucurosin or any anti, um, antibiotic could be applied, especially the, if you feel that the wound is contaminated. <laughs> So antibacterial ointments can be applied and other antibacterial um, um, dressings would be just gauze soaked in codeine that's betadine or acetic acid. All of this helps, uh, helps to keep a very uh, aseptic environment and provide healing. So that's covering medicated dressings. Um, so before, as we see a patient with wounds, it's just not enough to just dress the wounds, um, address the wound and just send the patient off. Please look, uh, please see before sending the patient off, please cover the patient with antibiotics and tetanus prophylaxis. So antibiotics usually given to uh, wounds that are at high risk where you have a foreign body, heavily soiled, bite wounds, puncture wounds, uh, wounds that involve an open fracture, an underlying fracture over there. So antibiotics can be used. Um, Depending on the patient, whether the patient, it's a small wound, the patient can be sent home. You can put them on a, on a course of just oral antibiotics. The most common antibiotic used is augmentin, that is uh, amoxicillin and clavulinic acid. So this is a very common um, antibiotic that's used, especially if you're discharging the patient. Uh, it, discharging the patient home, it covers both the gram-positive and gram-negative. If you feel that the that the wound is heavily contaminated, you would also want to try and cover it with anaerobic uh, a cover, so you can add metronidazole to it. The other the other things are if the wound is extensive, patient needs to come in. It's an open wound fracture. Uh, we typically give these um, uh, patients cover these patients with um, 
uh, cover these patients with a triple antibiotic that's to cover gram positive, gram negative, and anaerobic. So we usually give them a cephalosporin and aminoglycoside and also um, cover it with metanolazole. So it's usually given as cephalosporin, but it all depends. It depends how contaminated the wound is, how septic the wound is. So you can include um, cephalosporin, aminoglycoside like gentamicin and metanolazole to cover the wound antibiotic or to give an antibiotic coverage to such wounds. And last but not the least is providing tetanus prophylaxis. Um, very, very important uh, to, pre uh, to prevent tetanus. Please give the patient tetanus prophylaxis before you send the patient off. If the patient has been immunized um, uh, in the last five years, you don't need to give it. But very important, especially when you're in a rural area dealing with patients uh, who may or may not be immunized, covering them with post-exposure prophylaxis would be very important. Now, it's not enough to just um, see the wound, address the wound, you've done everything, and then send the patient off. Give, give, like, um, counsel the patient, safety net the patient before you can discharge the patient. So when, when I say safety net the patient, you've got to advise the patient on a certain amount of things. One is keep the wound as dry as possible because more moisture, more fluid, you're going to increase the risk of infection. The second thing is when do they need to come back and seek medical attention? Give them, counsel them, give them, give them the signs and symptoms that they could possibly, um, that they that they could catch on. For example, if the patient has had extreme pain, there's fast pouring out, there's um, uh, he's developing fever, extremely red. The 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 uh, the wound looks the wound is red, inflamed. Ask the patient to come back because we do not want to receive the patient when the patient's in sepsis and step in in a septic state. Uh, dealing it dealing with the wound at a local um, locally. That's dealing the dealing with the wound is much more easier than dealing a patient with a wound and systemic involvement when the patient is infected. So please safety net the patient before the patient goes. Next thing is give a follow-up plan because most patients are in the rural areas. They don't know what to do, how to go about dressing, how to go, when to remove sutures. So give them a follow-up plan. If you feel that the patient requires daily dressing, give them a time, give them uh, uh, give them the possible place that they could go for a dressing. Um, that's one. Two is when to remove sutures. Usually, most sutures are removed in five to seven days. So give them a date as to they need to come back for suture removal. Are these, some of them might just be unattended, and then there's a foreign body over there, which again causes uh, is another source of infection, and you're just going to cause a lot of complications. So before the sending of the patient, uh, before sending the patient off, safety net the patient and give a follow up plan uh, before you could do that. So um, I am going to be done. Uh, so the end, covering the entire wound management <laughs> is already done. We're going to be moving to uh, cases. So if I can have somebody volunteering for am which case. Audible. Am I audible? Yes, you are, Gansi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me be a part of this learning session. I congratulate the entire team in organizing this session. Thank you, Angeline, for presenting a topic which keeps on coming up every time uh, uh, anybody goes to a rural setup and goes there for work or for bond or for any other reasons. This, this topic of what to do with the wound usually comes up very often. So I'm, I'm very glad that you made a very uh, detailed as well as an organized presentation on the same. Uh, the next few cases which Angeline is going to show, it's more to do with how to deal or how to approach a wound rather than what to do exactly. Because in rural aid, in, in a rural setup, it's very difficult to find all the, the things required for every kind of wound. Okay, so the next few uh, cases are what you usually would encounter in a small setup. Uh, they might not be very fancy uh, or very complicated wounds, but they will have very far-reaching consequences sometimes. Yeah, uh, over to you, Angeline. I, I will interject whenever uh, there is 
anything to be discussed regarding the case yeah. i mean there is there is a, uh, i have a uh, reason why i said uh, any e even the smallest or the simplest of wounds can have uh, catastrophic consequences uh, so i will uh, interject whenever required angelin what do you yeah. thank you ganesh um so the first case is i would want volunteers to come up and tell me if you are please i instead of me picking up please volunteer and uh, it would be a lovely discussion to go about how to manage in wounds so the first case is we have a 33 year old male presented to the ane with a history of cut uh, cut laceration over the right forearm while cutting steel with an electric cutter uh if anyone come give me what kind of wound it is how would you manage this wound and if are there any in, additional investigations that you would want to go ahead with anybody you all can just unmute yourself and uh, do you want me to pick is it uh, has somebody said yes Okay, I'm just going to be picking then if uh, no one's going to be volunteering. Um, so by what I see is um, okay. I'm just going to go with the first one, Alina. Would you be able to answer what? Hello. What kind of... Hi, hi, Alina. Hi. Uh, it's a clean yeah. wound. It's a clean incised okay. wound. Okay. And how would you go about managing this? would you want any other any additional investigations to it um, yes, i would like to clean the wound okay uh, what we do here is we clean it with normal saline uh, yeah look yeah, for any okay. foreign body correct yeah uh, we give a wound wash and then uh, clean with better then uh, okay. i would like to suture the wound Correct. So this this wound seems to be a clean wound. It's a nice incised wound with uh, edges that are regular, can be easily approximated. So this wound can be easily at your primary center cleaned, cleaned with normal saline, antiseptic, and be sutured. But before suturing, when you when you deal with the history, uh, you have you're having a patient who's been dealing with steel. It's an electric cutter. before suturing would you want to do, to do anything else other than just exploring the wound seeing if there's any foreign body would an additional investigation aid to managing this patient in a better way what she means uh, to any ask other injuries uh, is is will you go ahead and directly suture this wound I mean, do do you require any investigations, or are you thinking something of something else? Uh, I had a similar patient about uh, I think in my first year of bond, 2015. I had a a, a very similar case history. Uh, 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 I think it I think it was a mason, I I believe, who had uh, come with a laceration over his wrist. now it it was a clean incised wound of about 2 cm the depth was about uh, maybe another 1 cm uh since the patient was poor and could not uh, warrant a referral i mean i i took a detailed history the only history that i got was uh, i he had no issues some minimal pain and some minimal bleeding he did give history of uh, loss of sensation over his third and fourth finger but he insisted that he really can't go to the city and get a plastic surgeon's uh, uh, evaluation so i the naive bonder that i was i sutured the wound and he comes back after 10 days saying that i cannot move two of my fingers what have you done now that is why we are asking you again would you suture the wound directly or would you do something check the neurovascular status excellent 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 that's exactly what i was looking for 
please please whenever there's a peripheral wound which is closer to your fingers or toes or any any major structure please examine the area for any other uh, loss of function once you do that is when you are sure that you're not dealing with anything else and most of these cut injuries whenever they are work related are very close to the peripheries because they are whatever instrument they are holding the closest thing they can injure is their peripheries yeah so make sure you do a detailed neurovascular examination okay otherwise if it's a straight forward lacerated wound where you're not suspecting anything and uh, any kind of neurovascular injury then you go ahead and suture the wound but again before suturing like angelin asked will you do any investigations for this anything which can help you in being sure that this is nothing but a simple wound especially in a very uh, uh, when when you're using drillers or cutters of which which uh, have a lot of rotations per minute you need to evaluate whether there's any other deeper injury okay not just a neurovascular uh, this one any tendon injury any vascular injury so evaluate uh, regarding that and another thing is sometimes when you work with wood and all that some foreign bodies get left behind so one of the investigations which you can do is a simple x ray if an x if an ultrasound is available an ultrasound most often than none you will close you will uh, suture this wound and the patient will come back with a feeling of a foreign body much later yeah so simple investigations can save time but if you are in any doubt there is any neurovascular injury please refer the patient to a plastic surgeon because the patient can come and put uh, and uh, there might be a legal issue on later days yeah, yeah. and yes. okay yes yeah. yeah. grantee has covered this really nicely so neurovascular please assess neurovascular and also other forms of a foreign body in it thank you alina um so the next case is you have a 44 year old male who presents to the casualty with the history of being with his hand being caught in the mill machine during repair what type of injury is this what are you going to do at a primary healthcare setup for this patient and what is the medical complication that you're going to be looking for especially it's just not enough dealing with this surgically but how are you going to what are the medical things that you're going to be looking for and how are you going to treat it is there anyone who would want to volunteer it's a really nice case it's it's something that we come across very regularly so uh keeping in mind the complications and what you need for to look for is is very interesting in a case like this anybody i don't want to pick so somebody come up sachin ebin anyone yes ah <laughs> uh, this looks like a crush injury yes in in this case the patient might have a lot of bleeding a lot of blood loss good yeah so it is important that we uh, somehow achieve uh, hemostasis yeah yeah okay. what complication uh, in this will you think of patient due to a lot of blood loss can go into shock so um, okay. just fluid resuscitation yeah, might not do the job i guess okay okay so you one thinking nerve. of shock so, okay. one of them is shock then then uh since it's a crush injury and possibly a lot of contamination uh Very risk good. for sepsis is well, also there yes yes okay okay so antibiotic car like angelin said probably a a triple antibiotic car okay correct yeah one of the first things that you need to assess a wound whenever you see any injury is what can you do at your place first and is it manageable at your place clearly 
even in my setup, I do not think I will be able to manage this. Why? Because this is his hand. He's probably a daily wage laborer, probably requires his hand for uh, work after that. Yeah. So um, uh, when keeping that in mind, you are looking to get maximum functionality as soon as the patient is taken to hospital. So what you can do when you see a patient like this is like like you rightly put there would be any there would be some vascular injury so trying to achieve hemostasis would be the first thing to do giving antibiotics everything comes secondary if you do not have uh, if if he profusely keeps bleeding he will not even reach a tertiary set second mm -hmm. counseling the uh, patient that you will require or he or she we might require further surgical intervention Surgical intervention could be in the form of an amputation, a minimal amputation might require plastic surgery intervention. Yeah, so uh, might require a, a vascular surgeon involvement. So all this needs to be counseled because they need to understand that this will not be okay in a smaller setup. Third thing is understanding that this can, like you said, can go into sepsis and uh, you you need to you need to cover uh, I mean after you dress the wound with uh, absorbable dressing after you have achieved some moderate amount of hemostasis by maybe putting a tourniquet uh, by giving probably some tranostat and then cover with your anti uh, tetanus prophylaxis as well as antibiotics yeah. So you 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 were right in the sense that you you went in a systematic way. So that's how you need to go about when you see a wound like this, because in a rural setup this is impossible to manage a wound like this. It requires a multi multidisciplinary approach. So and it it will have a very far-reaching consequences in the sense that he might not completely regain the function of his hand. So how best to go about it, the, the rehabilitation to the wound. That's what I said. So what you do initially determines what happens to the wound much later. So the earliest intervention, earliest antibiotic, earliest stop of uh, bleeding, stopping of bleeding would help, will go a long way in making sure that he has very minimal uh, loss of function. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, another thing is, uh, just to add to this case, is, is if, if you don't see such a large extensive loan, but if you, from the history you're suspecting, yes, it's a crush injury, uh, you've given the patient um, as every possible analgesic, systemic, everything, but the pain is still not under control. It's a possible crush injury. Pain is extremely out of proportion to what you're seeing and to what the patient com uh, complains. What is going to be at the back of your mind and how are you going to go about it? Just it, it just because you're in a bond center, you need to keep these things running in your mind because how fast can I refer the patient? How Which nearest center can I send the patient and how, what do I need to do next? And how can I aid in, in the, trans, the transition, like the patient moving from your hospital to the next hospital? In that time period, what could I do for the patient? Anybody with a crush injury or anything that comes to mind when you're dealing with a crush injury? Excruciate, the patient says excruciating pain. I have, you've given everything, you've gone to opioids, you've given morphine, you've given everything. The patient says, no, I'm still in a lot of pain. Any muscle relaxants? Uh, yeah, what, how are muscle relax? okay, uh, how are muscle relaxants going to be helpful? Sir? Do you think it's a muscle spasm? What's happening is you're, you're having a crush injury over a limb, it's a compartment, um, closed compartment. What's going to run behind your, run at the back of your mind? Compartment syndrome. Yes. If it's a, yeah. Very important. 
Yes, so this is something also that you could look at crushed injuries. One is compartment syndrome. You, you may not be having an extensive open wound like this, but the patient might have extreme amount of pain, especially if they have an underlying fracture or closed fracture, extreme amount of pain you given on a logistic please, please keep in mind um, um, compartment syndrome. So what are the um, features of compartment syndrome if anyone can tell me? There are six features, six P's to it. <laughs> Pulse will be absent, uh, it will become feeble, uh, and on passive stretch, the patient will have more pain. Mm. Pain cut too, yeah. Then there will be a, a swelling, and I don't know in terms of feet, but there will be localized swelling and tenderness. Okay. Okay, so six P's to be kept in mind. First thing, first thing, always remember if you're suspecting compartment syndrome, it's, it's pain, 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 and pain. They will have extreme pain. You do not want them to go further on. You do not want them to become pulseless. So there are six P's that we look for. Is One is extreme pain, pain on passive stretch, uh, pallor, the entire limb is cold, pale, purple in color. So that's pallor. Poikilothermia is a pain. The limb is quite cold, paralyzed. So the limb is paralyzed. Uh, and the, the last thing that you're waiting for is pulselessness. Like, don't try and keep the patient to come and uh, like to diagnose compartment syndrome when the patient is, when you do not have a pulse because you've lost the limb by then. So if the patient has extreme amount of pain, excruciating pain, you've not been able to control it with analgesics, please keep in mind that there could be a possibility of compartment syndrome. You might have to refer the patient immediately for a fasciotomy, or if you have a surgeon around um, in your surgical center, a quick fasciotomy would be very helpful in such in such um, cases. Okay, so that's that's one local uh, uh, complication. Uh, another thing is because it's a crush injury in such kind of patient, just to cover this, just for you all to keep it at the back of your mind, is uh, because it's a crush injury. There's a muscle injury, there's myoglobin released into the circulation. So such patients can go into rhabdomyolysis. So keep an eye, um, uh, so you might want to start off with fluid resuscitation because that's going to be really helpful. They are prone to developing AKI and um, uh, hyperkalemia. So these are the things that should be kept in mind while dealing with a patient with crush injury too. Is that okay? Okay. So I'm going on to the next third case. You have a 78 year old uh, bed bound, presented with history of fever, uh, and the wound over the buttocks for the for the past two weeks. Kara says the wound has been dressed and cleaned daily. You see the wound, and <laughs> how do you go about it? How is the wound healthy, and what kind of management would you want to go ahead? One of the most common. Uh, scenarios yeah, that you would see in your bond center or in a rural setup is this. So, what do you think the wound is, or wow, wow, yes. how do you go about managing this patient? Anybody, or should I pick again? Um, there's Pushpalata. Pushpalata, are you happy to um, answer these questions and go about managing this? Yeah, I don't think she's there. Anybody else? Elizabeth. Is that Pushpa? Anybody else willing to? We have only two volunteers, then Alina and Sachin. One of you, can you take this? Okay, yeah. Hello. Hi. Okay, it's a, Hi, uh, it's, so it's a pressure ulcer. Okay. Um, since the patient has history of fever also, the wound is not healthy. Okay. 
Um, management How would you go about be, managing uh, this scam? Okay, uh, so first, um, uh, we should keep in mind the comorb. Okay, uh, daily dressing. Okay, yes, but what is the mechanism? Uh, uh, Angeline had spoken in detail about how do you think about how, how do you approach a wound? You need to know or you need to think about whether you're stopping the force or the stopping the mechanism due to which the injuries or the, the, or the ulcer has happened. So what is the mechanism? Why, why has this ulcer happened? Since the patient is bed bound, there's a lot of pressure. Uh, okay. So um, mobilizing the patient, like changing the change of position. Very good, yes. That will go a long um, way. Trust me, it will go a long way in okay, uh, uh, helping the wound heal. Huh. Then putting an air mattress. Uh, okay, air or a water mattress would do. Water. Yes. Then um, we should keep in mind the comorbidities also. Uh, treating them along with the treatment of pressure also. Like okay. improving nutrition. Uh, how would you, yeah. How would you address the wound now? You, yes, you're right in uh, treating the mechanism of act, uh, the, how the ulcer is formed. You're right in treating the comorbidities. You're try, right in mo mobilizing the patient in some way, changing position every two hours. Excellent. How will you go about managing this wound? Uh, the wound doesn't look healthy, so we'll debride it first, clean the margins. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> okay, then what kind of dressing? I mean, she actually mentioned some kind of dressings that you will do. What kind of dressings okay, uh, are you planning to do for this patient? Would you use an, uh, a particular type or kind of dressing? What do you expect in a pressure sore? Initially, there are stages yeah. of pressure sores, right? If there's a very, if it's grade one, grade two, if it's an early sore, then it's not really bothersome, but it's already a crater. It's a nice sacral crater. And for some reason, somebody has already done a debridement and the patient comes with a wound, open wound like this. What do you expect in a patient like this? Because it's in the sacral area, because it's in an area where contamination is high. Okay, usually such patients are old patients who are on a diaper, who do not have the ability to go to a washroom. So there'll be a lot of contamination with feces. One, second thing is, uh, that uh, wound, there, there would be a gross neglect of the wound. So daily dressings would not have happened. Yeah. So counseling, okay. the first step should be counseling the attenders as well as the patient as to why we are doing what we're doing. Second thing is expect a lot of uh, exudate from the wound. Okay. So do an ad, uh, absorbent dressing. Yeah. So initially, once you debride, you will not see a great result uh, immediately because the whole mechanism has to, he, he, his position has to be changed and it'll take some time. So be patient with this wound. It will heal, but it requires a lot of dressing and a lot of care on the part of the attenders. So counseling the attenders as to why you need to do position change is very important. Uh, more, I mean, your dressing will go a long way, but if they do not do position change, there is no way that your wound will completely heal. Yeah, so you do a simple dressing, a simple, in, if the wound, if the wound looks like this, definitely do some debridement, give antibiotics, cover it. Okay, uh, if, the, if you have a surgeon in house, that would be great. Otherwise, do a basic and most of the patients would not be able to go to a higher center. So do a debridement and dress the wound regularly. Okay, more often than none, it's very superficial way, uh, slough which can easily be debrided and then you can do saline betadine dressings use a lot of gauze to absorb the exudate keep the wound dry as much as possible yeah uh, dry in the sense the exudate should not hamper the healing of your wound freshen the edges if possible yeah but see since the ulcer is already quite large usually it's quite large already so try and be very uh, uh, Minimalistic in your debridement. Don't be very aggressive in debriding the wound. And uh, a very deep wound with the sacrum exposed, 
definitely refer to a surgeon because uh, invariably what will happen is it will start getting uh, the ulcer might look from the top it might look like a simple 5 into 5 ulcer but what will happen is it will start burrowing inside yeah and you will not be able to do anything or uh, at your setup so do a simple uh, counsel the patient change position improve nutrition do a uh, simple saline dressing if the wound is very uh, uh, looks very unhealthy do a simple debridement give antibiotics keep a low threshold i'm mean, keep a uh, low threshold for referring to a general surgeon or a surgeon uh, if required yeah yeah okay sir yeah lovely so i think that was very well covered uh the next case is um you've got the fourth case you've got a 28 year old male brought in by bystanders with a history of stabbing my old friend after an altercation over money issues he's hemodynamically stable he's alert he's talking to you you see the knife still there in what do you do and what is your further plan for the patient anybody sachin eben nobody is there i think we're spending a lot of time on asking people um uh, angelin i i oh sachin you're there yeah there in anyone yeah yeah can you take the case please uh sir in this case i uh, the knife itself will probably have a you know a pressure effect so i think removing the knife is not the correct option not sure angelin yes grantin you want to go ahead with the discussion no uh see you um angelin has a lot of experience probably with uh, such kind of patients we see get a lot of such patients on christmas and yeah. new years yeah. yeah so yes so you'll be surprised yes. how many cases come like that and unfortunately despite widespread education you still have people who come saying that somebody stabbed them and they they pulled out the knife yeah some some yeah. people don't do that some people come with the uh, the stab the knife or whatever and they get the patient uh, as well uh, as it is so yes do you the i think the question itself answers uh, the answers itself so you know you do not remove the knife you are right in saying that because it gives a tamponade effect and without proper imaging you will be uh, causing more damage rather than uh, helping the patient the patient can really uh, lose a lot of blood in doing so yeah because you don't know what uh, where the knife is lodged so sachin what would you like to do for this patient definitely this patient require warrant referral there's nothing much that you can do uh, other than the fact that you probably can do Uh, a simple very small dressing around the area look for any other injuries yeah other than this injury look for any other injuries there's nothing much that you can offer this patient in your setup uh, and an early referral would be great uh, would really help uh, with the uh, prognosis of the case um, one of the things that will help uh when a patient like this comes to your setup and when you're referring say to a bigger center maybe a government hospital is a good history more often than than in um, a government setup they will be so overburdened with patients it's they will not have the time to take a very detailed history yeah so uh, try and elicit an history and give a good referral letter that goes a long way because that time whoever is the emergency most of the times these emergencies of government hospitals are manned by doctors 
who have just finished their MBBS. So again, they will be as lost uh, <laughs> dealing with this patient. So a good referral letter would obviously pique their interest and they will involve their surgeon early. Yeah, so no, you do not remove the knife. Your further plan of action, if you're at a primary care center, should be referred to a tertiary care center. There's nothing much that you can offer. Just make sure that you look for any other uh, injuries uh, involved because usually it is not just one step. There will be some lacerations, some gashes here and there. So don't miss other wounds only because there's a obvious knife sticking out to you. Yeah? Right. Yes. Very important is not to miss any other wounds. Please examine the patient from head to toe. With such patients, usually chest don't come with one. They have multiple and you will have to just, you might have to do just a local management of dealing with those two. So look for that too. Um, Another thing is, uh, uh, with regarding to a knife injury, please make sure you check, the, I mean, check vitals for every patient. I insist that. Uh, you do that for every patient, but do patients for high velocity injuries like a crush injury, like a car crash or a, a, a penetrating wound, please, please check vitals. Um, yeah. Sometimes a patient might be absolutely stable, like uh, he'll come with a stab injury, he might come walking to you, but when you check his uh, BP, his BP is low, he's very... Uh, tachycardic you know there is something else happening yeah that can give you an early uh what do you say pointer that you're dealing with something more than just a simple stab wound and there is some other injury yeah so please please check vitals i know it's difficult when you have a lot of patients but and uh, usually when such a case comes you you're you, you're suddenly uh shocked uh, as to what to do next your idea is to make sure the patient gets to a high center, but check vitals, see what you can do so that a patient reaches that tertiary care center. There's no point in just referring a patient if you have not checked vitals. So check vitals, make sure you resuscitate the patient if he requires resuscitation. But beyond that, definitely refer the patient. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable. You might want to consider using fluids if you feel that the patient's unstable. Genexamic acid, again, going to be helpful in achieving hemostasis. So look at the patient before you even send the patient off. Make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable. Um, the next case is we have a seven-year-old boy brought in with a history of dog bite over the face. What category of wound does this the dog bite belong to? Would you suture this wound and what is the course of treatment? Anybody? I think Mary hasn't uh, answered. So, Mary, would you want to give a try? Yeah, uh, I'll Mary. just make sure that. Uh, hello? Yes, yeah. Hello. Hi, Rosemary. Yeah. Uh, I'll just make sure that there's no bleeding first and okay. uh, usually in dog uh, clean first uh, initially we'll have to run it under mm -hmm. water clean it with lots of water or normal saline and okay. then make sure there's no bleeding uh, if there's no bleeding I wouldn't close it immediately because in dog bite case we're not supposed to close the wound and allow it for uh, tertiary intention I think and okay. uh, it's a grade uh, three, category three wound. Right. So yes. both rabies vaccine and uh, even immunoglobulin would be needed. Okay, <laughs> lovely. I think you covered it. You covered it well. I think the only thing you would add to it is uh, make sure that the patient has also got a tetanus dose, and you might want to cover it with antibiotics also. Uh, do you know what? How would you grade dog bites? How? What are the categories in? How would you grade them? There's a WHO grading. So, do you know what how it is? Ma'am, uh, sorry, we would categorize. There's three categories. First one yeah. in which there's no break in skin. It's usually okay. 
a lick or an intact skin or a scratch, but the skin is intact. In second, there is a uh, skin is breached, but it's mostly an uh, uh, aberration and it's not deep. Grade yeah, three is puncture, yeah, puncture wound and deep cuts are in grade three. Okay, so they belong to category three. Now, um, the main the why I put this question up is it's involving the face. Um, do you have to suture it immediately? As you correctly said that, yes, because it's a dog bite, you do not want to suture it immediately. You do not want to close it by primary intention because the risk of it uh, of spreading rabies would be would, would be even more because with each bite you're taking, you're going to be injuring nerves and the spread is going to be extensive. So you wouldn't want to, um, uh, what to say, suture this immediately. Uh, but... Uh, according to the WHO and various guidelines, they say that if the wound involves the face or the genital region, uh, you could suture the uh, or the patient is extensively bleeding. You could suture the um, the wound, but only after immunoglobulin is given to the patient. So you first infiltrate immunoglobulin and then consider suturing. So um, I think we've got you correctly covered what the different categories of wound uh, of a uh, dog bite whether you would suture it or not, and how would you go about treating this patient. So uh, these are wounds that we will come across daily. Please do not forget, does anyone know what the regimen is for anti-rabies vaccine? Somebody is answering. If you could just give me <laughs> the days. So that you're aware of how to go about it because you you need to give the patient the dates when to come back for the next injection. Hello. Hello. Hi. It's intramuscular root. Uh, we give 0.5 ml on day uh, 0, 3, 7, uh, 14, and 28. Lovely. Yes. And <laughs> Yeah, so you've covered that up. So please don't forget to give a tetanus shot to cover the patient with tetanus. And if, if you feel that the patient if it's an extensive deep wound category three, cover it with antibiotics too. So yes, so that was the last case for our discussion. Does anyone have doubts? Anything that you would want to ask? Because we have Gan see who's um, a consultant surgeon who's with us. So he'll be able to guide you through any doubts that you all might be encountering as physicians in the primary healthcare center? We, we suggested this uh, topic because even though uh, detailed sessions happen in college, I realize practical management is not really touched upon. And even mm -hmm. during intern, we just have a one and a half month posting where we have a lot of other things to do, like filling forms and writing case sheets. And I know that's a that's a, just one part. The dressings are just one part of this one. The PG don't really get time to teach you about how, what different dressings you can do. Yeah. So I keep getting doubts every now and then about how do you manage this? What dressing do you do? So that was the whole idea of the session. Uh, I would definitely Angela and me were speaking about doing more sessions, but you will, you guys will have to uh, come up with topics. Yeah, you guys will have to tell the the organizers as to what is the what is the most common surgical issue that you face. This was our our idea. What what uh, I thought you guys would encounter, but definitely there would be more issues, more pressing issues as to uh what what uh, some surgical issues that you will find in your rural setup so we would be more than happy to take sessions on those but you guys would have to tell us what you want us to speak about and then we can probably go according to that yeah yeah any questions yeah. about it? celebrating Diwali's. I think Meryn has a question. Yeah, when there's a laceration at the eyelid, uh, very near the um, 
near very near the margin and the yeah. patients are not willing to go to a, a higher center where there's plastic surgery or anything what type of suture material and what suturing should we try like once they have degraded but many a times they don't agree to go to a higher center so we'll only have to attempt doing it no no fair so, enough fair enough that, that's uh though i have not got many cases uh, like that during my bond time but i'm sure that one of the uh, problems especially with children uh, that our children or elderly for that matter who come with such injuries now yeah you can put a non absorbable uh, suture they again depends on whether there is a proper avulsion of the lid or if it's a simple cut straight forward cut then you can have a non absorbable suture you it since it's the eye and uh, cosmetic uh, issues might pop up later try and put a 40 suture if you can otherwise it, uh, just give a good wash if see again just because they are not willing to go to a higher center does not mean they are willing to get suturing done so most often they refuse to do anything about it but if a patient is willing for a procedure uh, try and give local anesthesia clean the wound uh, give an antibiotic clean the wound well see if there is debris uh, i personally feel any facial injury any fa- facial laceration uh, take your time with it give a good wash and then plan on suturing but also counsel the counsel the patient that there is good chance that there will be muck and debris stuck inside it and they, it can get infected yeah because uh, just because you put suturing some patient will be like okay you've done the suturing but this has happened so always 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 even though wound looks clean there might be small micro debris inside the wound which causes uh, uh, an infection so go ahead give a good wash give local anesthesia uh, if suturing is required go ahead and do a 40 or if you really into a 250 non absorbable sutures but yeah definitely you can go ahead and suture and there should not be any problems the lid heals well usually and then if if there are some small uh, uh when once the wound contracts there might be some uh, issues with the lid so you can definitely counsel and get an ophthalmologist's opinion then but i i don't think there should be any problem in suturing lid if they absolutely do not want to go to a higher center thank you yes anyone else yeah. uh, one thing if a patient comes with a burst varicose vein is pressure mm. the only management that we can try at that time or is there anything else that we have to uh there are things that you can do other than uh, the pressure what is varicose vein is just a tortuous vein how would you um, and it's it's uh, even if you ligate it there's not a problem now because it's just like any other vein it's there's not much function in terms of uh, uh, suturing it so what i suggest is when you have a, a bleeding varicose vein it usually is because of the break of the skin so you will not be able to uh, achieve control with just pressure so uh what i suggest is you take a bite about 1 cm above and below the vein yeah so you can take a non absorbable sutures let the sutures stay there what happens is because of avascular necrosis the whole thing just it's just another way of stopping if you can otherwise what most of the time about 80 to 85% pressure itself will sort out the issue but this is one thing that you can do if a patient has very bad varicose veins and uh, the bleeding is just not stopping and you need something to do so you can uh, put take a bite a deep bite okay a 1 cm above and 1 cm below usually bleeding stops with that you can do uh, give some tranostat soaked gauze dressing or some adrenaline soaked gauze dressing also prior to the suturing so you can give pressure does not stop give uh, adrenaline soaked uh, gauzes or tranostat soaked gauzes give it some time does not stop take a bite above and below the uh, bleeder it usually stops after that okay then you can definitely send it over to your surgeon thank you 
Thank you. Thank you, Garthi. Anybody else for questions, doubt? Is Tijo there? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you all for joining in on the weekend. Uh, it's been useful and has enabled you to manage wounds better. I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to the museum and the fans. It was a really interactive, useful session. And thank you to dedicate some time for the mm -hmm. time between. A few things to note before we end a feedback from and join at Academy's WhatsApp group. Please fill it. Recordings of the sessions will be posted on YouTube. We must have a special YouTube channel. Thank you. The drop. The real sessions will be posted on our social media channels. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jido. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Bye bye, and have a good evening. Yeah, happy Diwali to everyone. <laughs> yeah, take care of the film. Thank you.